O.J. Simpson was acquitted of the brutal double murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. The verdict exposed deep racial divisions in this country that still exist today. Over the years, many have tried to explain the Simpson case. But we at Court TV believe the best explanation of what actually happened is the trial itself. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. From the beginning, it is referred to as the trial of the century. The people's case? O.J. Simpson killed his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and Ron Goldman. The timeline works. The evidence is clear. The defense? Simpson has been framed. Investigators were incompetent, biased, and rushed to judgment in a way that underscores a history of systemic problems within the LAPD. But before there are attorneys, before any courtroom moments, and before any of the nonstop news coverage, there's a story of murder. Two victims brutally killed on the night of June 12th, 1994. Their bodies are discovered on the walkway leading up to Nicole's condo in Brentwood. The crime itself was about as horrific as you can imagine. There was so much blood. Uh, you have to remember that Nicole was nearly decapitated and bled out on the sidewalk. Um, Ron was stabbed a couple dozen times and there was lots of blood. And it was a very small area and there were two little kids, their little kids, her little kids sleeping upstairs. The brutal murders occur in the upscale Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles, a safe place where wealthy people live with manicured lawns and a sense of security and quiet. Where it happened in Brentwood was a very safe community. I mean, you don't expect anything like that to happen there. People always say, that never happens here. That's what people would say about Brentwood. During that June night while watching the 10 o'clock news, one of Nicole's neighbors hears a barking dog wailing as if sounding an alarm. Another neighbor decides to take the lost dog for a walk and is led to the bodies of Nicole and Ron. During that same night of June 12th, O.J. Simpson is picked up by a limo at his home on Rockingham Avenue. He takes the red eye to Chicago for a business trip. Shortly after he arrives, the LAPD calls O.J. and tells him that Nicole has been killed and asks him to come back. They had seen a trail of blood at his house, and when they learn that Simpson is unharmed, they suspect he may have been involved in the murders. He returns to L.A. immediately, the police waiting for him at his home. He was briefly handcuffed when he was talking to police and a camera crew that had made their way around to the other part of the property captured it. Meanwhile, the families of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman are coming to grips with the sudden and awful loss of their loved ones. First and foremost, Nicole was involved in her children's lives. Nicole was like a hands-on mom. She looked glamorous. She was beautiful. She was vibrant. She was full of life. Ron was amazing. Uh, from the practically the day he was born, always an amazing young man, uh, always kind, always thoughtful. He was Kim's brother and best friend forever. My brother was coming into his own at 25 years old. The closeness that we shared was undeniable and that feeling of knowing that you always have someone that has your back. Um, and that didn't change the older we got and obviously the last act of his life proved that my brother and, and his soul was a protector. Today, my office filed murder charges against O.J. Simpson. Simpson agrees to turn himself in. 
But he never shows. When he didn't show up, and then Robert Kardashian, his friend, reads this letter. I think of my life and feel I've done most of the right things. So why do I end up like this? I can't go on. The Los Angeles Police Department right now is actively searching for Mr. Simpson. It's like when the space shuttle Challenger blew up or when the Twin Towers were hit. You know where you were when that happened. It wasn't a chase in a traditional sense. It was O.J. Simpson reportedly in the back seat of a Bronco with a gun to his head. And you'd see people lining the overpasses, go, O.J., go, that type of thing, homemade signs. Because at this point, O.J. Simpson was still beloved, right? Nobody could believe that he would be a killer. It just didn't seem to make sense. Mr. Simpson is a wanted murder suspect, two counts of murder, a terrible crime. O.J., wherever you are, for the sake of your family, for the sake of your children, please surrender immediately. Simpson eventually surrenders to police and is taken into custody. At the time of his arrest, O.J. Simpson is 46 years old, a legendary Heisman Trophy winner, a Pro Football Hall of Famer, a star with movie and TV fame. He has pioneered American advertising as one of the first African Americans to be a spokesperson for a major company. But now, he's a celebrity behind bars. When they meet in 1977, 30-year-old OJ is married and Nicole is just 18 years old. They have two children during their seven-year marriage. They were very much in love. I mean, they, they loved each other. They were husband, wife. They did, you know, they traveled together. It was, for a long time, a very good family unit. But what looks like an ideal marriage is actually a toxic relationship filled with violence. Nicole? Oh, you still on the line? Yeah. You think he's still gonna hit you? I don't know. You're gonna leave, you just said that. You just said he ain't leaving. He looked me in the eye and he said, how can anybody think I'm guilty? And I said, OJ, Everybody thinks you're guilty. Alan Dershowitz is just one of a remarkable lineup of top-tier, high-profile lawyers brought in from around the country by Robert Shapiro to defend O.J. Simpson including the legendary F. Lee Bailey, DNA specialist Barry Sheck, and civil rights litigator Johnny Cochran, a group that comes to be known as the Dream Team. At this time, do you wish to enter a plea guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Your Honor, at this time, we would uh, ask that the court uh, adjourn the hearing to the next day. I knew Johnny Cochran, and I knew Robert Shapiro from our days as undergrads at UCLA. I'd worked for the L.A. County DA's office and knew several of the prosecutors. After Simpson's arrest, Robert Shapiro asked me to attend a meeting. Almost every top criminal lawyer in Los Angeles was there. I remember Shapiro standing in front of us saying, we intend to win this case, there will be no plea bargain. None of us thought he had a chance. During the 37 weeks of the trial, I was occasionally made privy to defense strategies and insights that I've never talked about publicly. For example, one thing I feel has never been made clear enough is how Robert Shapiro put his own ego on hold and stepped back from the limelight in the interest of his client, something for which he has never been given full credit. The legal horsepower of the Dream Team brings into focus the role of celebrity in the Simpson case. Not just the fame of the defendant, but the legal resources he is able to afford. During the preliminary hearing and pretrial arguments, it becomes apparent that the prosecution is overmatched and outmaneuvered at almost every turn by the defense. For example, Mark Furman. He is a central figure in making the case for the prosecution as the investigator who says he found a bloody glove at the murder scene and another at O.J. Simpson's house. As I walked closer and I got oriented to where this noise probably came from, I looked down and I saw a dark object. I was probably still. 15, 20 feet away, and I kept walking closer. And then I saw when I was a few feet away that it was a glove. 
initially and at the time I felt Mark Furman was a good cop and I thought he intuitively did some things particularly at Rockingham which were the hallmark of a good cop it's just business as usual they made it something else that started ruining my life but to underscore how the prosecution is overwhelmed by the dream team listen to how F. Lee Bailey turns Furman's history into something that makes the case for the defense that O.J. Simpson has been framed once Furman hits the stand we're able to ask him don't you hate black people and haven't you said so on many occasions and particularly this occasion after you learn that this defendant had a romantic entanglement with a Caucasian woman. If the only evidence you have that this glove came from O.J. Simpson's home is Detective Mark Furman, that isn't enough evidence to convict a rat, let alone a human being. In addition to that, we have told you in our papers, and perhaps for the first time, that Detective Furman then went on within hours to suppress vital evidence tending to exculpate the defendant. So if he suppressed evidence and claimed to find incriminating evidence, I think we hardly need go further before we have the right to ask him, and by the way, haven't you said on past occasions that you are in favor of genocide? Because what he really said was, let's put them all in a pile and burn them all. And I haven't heard that come from anyone since Adolf Hitler. Those are the facts. That is exactly 180 degrees opposite of the truth. And you don't want to hear the truth. So this is false. I don't have to call anybody a liar. It's the opposite of what occurred. That's the problem with them. They always want to label everybody. Which we know is not true. We keep hearing about the truth. Very misleading. I don't think they can stand the truth. Again, completely no! misleading. They are in for the fight of their lives. All right, are both sides prepared to go forward, Mr. Packman? We are, Your Honor. Clark? Yes, sir. All right, do the people wish to make an opening statement? Yes, we do, All right, you may proceed. Mr. Darden? Did O.J. Simpson really kill Nicole Brown and Ronald Golden. The evidence will show that the answer to the question is yes. O.J. Simpson murdered Nicole Brown and Ronald Golden. Why would he do it? Why would he do it? Not O.J. Simpson, not the O.J. Simpson we think we know. O.J. Simpson was beloved at the time. He was an icon, a hero. But that raises another question, and that question is, do you know O.J. Simpson? The face you'll see be the face of a batterer, a wife beater, an abuser, a controller. He killed her because he couldn't have her. And if he couldn't have her, he didn't want anybody else to have her. So you're going to be hearing evidence regarding domestic abuse, domestic violence, stalking, intimidation, physical abuse, wife beating, public humiliation. The dominant theme throughout their relationship was his control of Nicole Brown. And the evidence would show in this case that this man is an extremely possessive, controlling individual. This is all part of his need to know where she is, to know who she's with, to know what she's doing, to control her. It's control. It's all about control. You'll be hearing evidence regarding an incident that happened on January 1, 1989. The 911 operator received a telephone call from Rockingham. We can hear the sound of a woman being beaten now, right now. And the officers arrived at Rockingham a short time later. And as she ran toward the officers, she was shouting and yelling, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And the officer said, who? Who's going to kill you? And she said, O.J. is going to kill me. And the officer said, Mr. Simpson, we're going to have to place you under arrest. It appears that your wife has been beaten. And he responded, the police have been here eight times before. And now you're going to arrest me for this? She would tell me, she goes, Denise, you know what? He's going to kill me one day, and he's going to get away with it. Finally, after 17 years, he finally got the message. It finally became clear that she wanted to live her own life. 
Christopher Darden grows up just north of San Francisco. He plays high school football and runs track in college. He joins the LA District Attorney's Office in 1980, working in the gangs unit, and then special investigations, which oversees cases of criminal activity by public officials and law enforcement. He's 38 years old, with 15 years experience as a prosecutor when he joins the Simpson prosecution team. The thing that I remember most about Chris is just how frustrated he would get and how personally he took the trial. I liked Chris. I thought that he was busting his tail on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's fair to say that I have the toughest job in town today. Chris Darden was accused of being put on this team because he was African-American, not because he's a good lawyer. Chris Darden, it was a very difficult place to be for someone like him. You know, helped the prosecution develop credibility with the black community uh, and the black jurors. It puts him in a very uncomfortable position because he's sort of um, on the other team, so to speak. It wasn't about anything except who committed the double murder. That's what it was about. It wasn't about race. He was completely closed off, totally um, cold and <laughs> unwelcoming, um, brooding. And then as the trial moved on, Chris softened and opened his heart deeper to my dad and I and our family. Chris and I are still super good friends. What we've been seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is, is, is the public face, the public persona. It is not the actor who is on trial here today, ladies and gentlemen. It is not that public face. It is his other face, the one that Nicole Brown encountered during the last moments of her adult life. The following program contains graphic images and language. Viewer discretion is advised. saw a sight that he'll never forget. He saw the body of Nicole Brown lying at the foot of the steps in a pool of blood. What I'm showing you here is a shoe print again. Right here. Heel print, bloody heel print, and another one here. What you see here is what officers Risky and Terrasa saw when they arrived at the scene. You can see here the paw prints. Officer Risky went all the way up to the uh, end of the walkway in the bushes to where, to a point where he was able to see at that point that it was not just Nicole, but also Ron. There was a... an image that was projected on the screen um, of my brother's body that I had never seen before. And I remember feeling panic because I didn't know, I'd never seen it. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then Marcia turned around very quickly and apologized. We did warn you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a case that was going to have photographs that would be very, very hard to look at. We have to show you the evidence, and I apologize for the graphic nature of them, but this is the crime that we're here to examine. No one will argue about what the cause of death was for Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. These are the blood drops at the Bundy location at 875 South Bundy. This blood drop that you see here matches the defendant. 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 You analyze the DNA and you see, can I exclude the suspect? Can I rule him out? Is there anything here inconsistent with the suspect? The glove that was found at the south walkway of the defendant's property at Rockingham revealed blood that was consistent with a mixture of Ron Goldman, Nicole Brown, and the defendant. Over and over again, we asked ourselves, can the defendant be excluded? And over and over and over again, the answer was no. The defendant cannot be excluded. 
Marcia Clark grows up outside Oakland, California. At 17, she is attacked and raped, something she later says influenced her decision to become a prosecutor. After law school, she works briefly as a defense attorney before joining the LA District Attorney's Office in 1981. By the time she takes on the Simpson case, she has won 19 of 20 murder trials. Tough lawyer, very able, very prepared, very, very able. Johnny Cochran was talking to jurors and Marsha Clark was talking at jurors. Marsha Clark was somebody who thought she knew everything and she was arrogant and overconfident. I, I can only reiterate that... No, you don't need to reiterate if I've already heard it. I apologize to the court. I thought that... I mean, I can't keep doing these things over and over and over again. She was, uh, I would say, a, a tigress as a trial attorney. Uh, she had taken on tough cases under adverse circumstances and held up and prevailed. Uh, she was very facile with trace evidence cases, uh, hair, fiber, DNA, and the like. The mere fact that we find blood where there should be no blood, in the defendant's car, in his house, in the driveway, and even on the socks in his very bedroom, at the foot of his bed, that trail of blood from Bundy through his own Ford Bronco and into his house in Rockingham is devastating proof of his guilt. And the results of the analysis of that blood confirms what the rest of the evidence will show. That on June the 12th, 1994, after a violent relationship in which the defendant beat her, humiliated her, and controlled her, after he took her youth, her freedom, and her self-respect, just as she tried to break free, Orenthal James Simpson took her very life in what amounted to his final and his ultimate act of control. And in that final and terrible act, Ronald Goldman, an innocent bystander, was viciously and senselessly murdered. As the first week of the trial unfolds, Johnny Cochran gives the opening statement for the defense. O.J. Simpson's lead attorney tells the jury the central themes of their case. Sloppy police work and a rush to judgment. The opening statement is not opening argument, but it's not just that, opening statement. If you've had occasion to go to a movie, you know that there's something called the previews of coming attractions. And that's what this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a guide. Our roadmap, if you will, what we expect the evidence to show. Johnny Cochran, was a brilliant lawyer. And here we are now in this search for justice. You hear a lot about this talk about justice. His firm at that time was all civil rights police misconduct work, all civil litigation, no criminal. Johnny Cochran, of course, uh, had uh, tremendous appeal as a trial lawyer, uh, particularly within the African-American community. I guess Dr. Martin Luther King said it best when he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so we are now embarked upon this search for justice, this search for truth. We're going from, from California back to the South. I wanted to go to this bathroom, and I wasn't mindful of, uh, of any of you know, blacks go one place, whites go another. And so I was going to go in this bathroom, and this guy said, you can't go in there, boy. That, that let me know there was, there was a problem, and I remember talking to my dad about that. Now, I was troubled by that, and, and again, that just reinforced my, 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 my belief and my, my, the things should change and, and my desire to change things. My whole career has been trying to represent people who need to be represented, whose civil rights have been violated. Johnny Cochran understands that on the heels of the Rodney King beating by Los Angeles police officers and the subsequent trial, the riots are a symptom of something bigger. L.A. is engulfed with tension torn apart by racial animus and policed by a department many fear instead of trust. As a city, we were still really raw. We were still really 
feeling that that pain that had just happened. I knew Johnny Cochran for years as a friend and as a brilliant litigator who specialized in civil rights cases and believed strongly in the presumption of innocence. What most people didn't know was that Johnny's standard approach was to put the evidence on trial, question the investigator's professionalism and their motives. As Johnny told me one night at dinner, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let me try to set the record straight for you. This glove was not found by them or the officers or whatever. This glove was found by Detective Furman. The defense strategy was, you can't trust the message if you can't trust the messenger. Detective Mark Furman will play an integral part in this case for a number of reasons. Now, it's very interesting that the prosecution never once mentioned his name yesterday. It's like they just want to hide him. But they can't hide him. He's very much a part of this case. We can only ask ourselves, why didn't they mention him? I think that answer will become very clear to you as the case progresses. We proved um, that there was a rush to judgment, that the messengers were the LAPD, that they had made up their mind about who did this. It didn't matter what the world thought. It mattered what those 12 jurors thought. And Johnny Cochran never lost sight of the fact that he was playing to those jurors. This case is about a rush to judgment. There's a rush to judgment here. But they didn't want to listen because they made their decision in this rush to judgment. But as jurors, I'm sure you're not going to rush to judgment. Johnny Cochran easily uh, was the guy that I would have hired to join me if I had been first in the case. I mentioned before this crime scene and the number of people who were allowed to walk through there, many with just their shoes on, walking right through the blood. Some had gloves, some didn't have gloves. Picking up the evidence, this will become very relevant and important to you as you hear from the experts about the contamination aspect of this, and what it means, how easy it is to sneeze, to touch, whatever. And this evidence will become contaminated. The defense's strategy was to paint the law enforcement agents as bungling idiots, but yet they were smart enough to frame an innocent man, but they were too stupid to pull it off correctly. We think the evidence will show that this scene was tracked and traced up, and the gathering of evidence was a complete disaster. The evidence will show that this careless, slipshod, negligent collection, handling, and processing of samples by basically poorly trained personnel from LAPD has contaminated, compromised, and corrupted the DNA evidence in this case. This is, by all accounts, 21st century cyberspace technology that is being used by these police departments with covered wagon technology. The fact that blood mysteriously appears on vital pieces of evidence and is predictive what the results will be regarding DNA when that evidence is still in the police lab is devastating evidence of something far more sinister. I want you all to remember that your conduct here will have an impact not only upon the welfare of your respective clients, but upon the image of our profession for many years to come. Those who say the criminal justice system itself is on trial may be correct in that uh, observation. I am absolutely appalled. The people have a right to know. They cannot shut me up. They've been lied to. I'm not going to hear it again. I've ruled. They've been deceived. That's why they lose cases sometimes. Did you hear what I said about two minutes ago? call from Bob Shapiro saying we'd like you to join the defense team and I said no I can't because I've already commented that I believe he's guilty and Bob said well everybody thinks he's guilty the defense team is packed with big egos and some bold ideas on how to defend OJ Simpson some of them judge Ito allows and some of them he doesn't probably be times when I like Mr. Simpson to be able to approach the jury to demonstrate certain things that I think are very relevant in the course of that opening statement. It is only a blatant attempt to impress the jury with his charisma and star appeal. The motion to allow him to exhibit to the jury his knee injuries or the result of the scarring and, and the surgeries will be allowed. And I'd like at this point to have Mr. Simpson come over to the jury so I can demonstrate the problem with his knees. 
This is an incredible moment. The person, O.J. Simpson, who's up for double murder, by the way, um, gets to walk up to the jury box right next to the church. Yeah, there are a few deputies there, but he's not in shackles. And he's making a connection with the jury out of the gate in opening statements. It's a huge advantage for the defense, and this is right out of the gate. Judge Ito allows this unprecedented. circumstantial evidence so the dog and and the plaintiff whale and and the evidence that was given by the dog walker they, they just try to establish a timeline and the timeline is loose because you don't know exactly when somebody was killed you try to determine it based upon what else is going on and what else people are hearing or seeing both sides fight hard to get the jury to believe their timeline for the night of the murders the defense has to account for O.J.'s whereabouts at the time of the killings. The prosecution has to pinpoint the time of death based on a dog. Now what I'm about to describe to you is a series of events that proves that the murders occurred between 9.35 and 10.45 on the night of June the 12th. Hello, at approximately 9.50 p.m., Ron Goldman left the restaurant still dressed in his waiter's uniform, the white dress shirt, the black pants, and the black shoes and his friends at the restaurant never again saw him alive. She described for you how he was dressed. I think she said with some white shirt and black pants or whatever. You saw those pictures as, as, as terrible as they were. He was in some jeans and some kind of shoes that are far different. And the evidence would be he went home, dropped off a book, changed clothes before he came to Nicole Brown Simpson. But the reason that you weren't told those facts yeah, bro, is because it's they keep this thing for team time. 1015, Pablo Fendez heard a dog bark. He remembered it clearly because the bark was like a plaintive and insistent roar, like nothing he'd ever heard before. Ms. Clark uh, kept telling you that she had to fix the time of death in this case at about, what she say, about 1015? She had to make it 1015, and she made it based upon a dog's way. Now, this is the first case you'll ever hear where the prosecution's theory is that you've got to determine the cause of the time of death by a dog's wail. What he noticed when he pulled to that area that was right in his field of view is that there was no car parked there. No white Ford Bronco. And it was 1039. She said to you that the limousine driver, when he came and left to take Mr. Simpson to the airport, she told you that he did not see the Bronco parked there. It's not exactly what he said in his testimony at the preliminary hearing in the grand jury. At 10.45, Cato was talking to his girlfriend, Rachel, when suddenly he heard on the wall where the air conditioner was three loud thunks. They've got to keep everything squashed in there so they can tell you, oh, we had plenty of time to commit this crime. When we conclude today, you're going to see there was no time to commit this crime. They have to tell you that it's about a dog's whale when a man's life is at stake. Was O.J. physically capable of stabbing Ron and Nicole in such a short period of time? Now, the prosecution has a workout video that O.J. made two weeks before the murders. The defense claims O.J. was having an arthritis flare-up that made him too weak to commit the murders. There will be testimony that O.J. Simpson suffers with chronic rheumatoid arthritis. When it's an acute phase, he has great trouble functioning. We expect there will be testimony that on the date of June 12th, Mr. Simpson was involved in the acute phase of his rheumatoid arthritis. And on that day, after he had played golf, Problems with his hands were so severe he could not shuffle the cards when he played gin rubber at the country club thereafter. Mr. Cochran made some comments to you about the defendant's alleged arthritic condition. According to him, uh, the defendant's arthritic condition became acute sometime after he'd played golf and after he'd been swinging the golf club on the evening of June the 12th at about 10 p.m. He said at some point after that, the arthritic condition became acute. 
Mr. Cochran told you that the defendant's uh, physical capabilities are very limited as a result of that condition. The prosecution will show you evidence to the contrary. We will show you outtakes of an exercise videotape which was made by the defendant only two weeks before the murders. We will show you a portion of that videotape to demonstrate just what the defendant's physical capabilities really were on the evening of June the 12th, 1994. The defendant prided himself in that tape. 19 murders. We will show you a portion of that videotape to demonstrate just what the defendant's physical capabilities really were on the evening of June the 12th, 1994. Get real. Get real. We will try one more time. Okay, go. The defendant prided him. Research shows nostalgia can help you remember ads. So customize and save with Liberty Mutual. Imagine what would happen if every person in the United States suddenly visited your website. Would it? A brisk walk. <laughs> Refined sugar is the most used food additive we eat. On a typical day, we consume about one third of a pound. Now, pure sugar contains only calories. In simple terms, that means it provides no vitamins, no minerals, no fiber. Sugar does help prevent spoilage and improve texture, but its main function is for flavoring. It's processed into soups, breads, salad dressings, spaghetti sauce, ketchup, and cured meats. Did you know that a can of soda has anywhere between six and nine teaspoons of sugar? Or that honey is pure sugar? Get that down. One more time, we're going to take a little break. ...himself in that tape on being in good physical condition. You will see him doing push-ups. You will see him lifting his arms overhead. Stretch the upper body, but reaching for a leg. You know, reaching for the air. You will see him stretching. This is a chest stretch. Ah, just put those arms back, push them out, push that chest out there. We're going to show you that tape during the course of this trial. Days were very intense, and they began first thing in the morning and went well into the night. In addition, for a little bit of time to think of other discussion, just excuse me, I'm, I need to slow down myself a little bit, Your Honor. Give me just a moment. Yesterday, the, or the other day, the court said it had to take a deep breath. Allow me to take one too. I've had long experience with Mr. Hodgman. I've uh, known him as a as a colleague as a trial lawyer, and I've, I've never seen the expressions on his face that I've seen today. What I'm asking you to do is take a few deep breaths, evaluate what you have, and then come to me with a proposal as to how we proceed to move on. And I suspect you may unplug your computer and take it home with you tonight. Maybe a long time before I get home tonight, Your Honor. He was disoriented later. He was complaining about chest pains and other physical symptoms. We we were working until approximately 1.30 in the morning, and we were doing so without the benefit of the assistance of Mr. Hodgman, who uh, was taken to the hospital at, uh, I believe, approximately 6 p.m. I discovered, as a result of getting tested, that apparently I had an abnormality in the musculature of my heart, which had proved fatal for certain athletes historically, and I had the same thing. So that was... Uh, an awkward and, and shocking revelation. Alright guys, see you guys, I'm gone. The 
scene outside the courthouse looks more like a circus than a trial. There really hadn't been frenzies like that before, that where there was just 24-7 coverage, where there were dozens and dozens and dozens of cameras. The scene is much the same immediately outside of the courtroom. The scene in and around the courthouse, uh, I would characterize as just crazy. And I remember Marsha and I looked at each other, and the thought that passed between us was, we can't do this. Inside the courtroom, a single camera is mounted on the wall above the jury box. It opens up the trial to a worldwide audience of 50 million viewers. It was really the first case of its kind where people could watch from start to finish and watch it unfold and be frustrated because this was a real life soap opera. The headlines are everywhere, but looking at the coverage, it's almost like the country is watching two different trials. On the one hand, the trial shines a spotlight on mainstream media's racial blind spot, starts a national conversation about domestic abuse, and the reality that African American and white communities have vastly different experiences and impressions when it comes to law enforcement. On the other hand is the Los Angeles Sentinel, one of the oldest black-owned weekly newspapers in the country. It breaks with the national media and covers the trial with a clear pro-defense perspective. Its articles are syndicated coast to coast to other African-American papers. The perception that black America had about this case was largely filtered through the LA Sentinel in distinction to, say, the more mainstream coverage of the case. The Sentinel always carried the news and from the perspective of the African-American community. So it was, it was nothing new to us that the Sentinel was front and center in terms of carrying the story and the story that, that was coming from us that was best known to us. The Sentinel faces head on the issue of race as a factor in the Simpson trial in a way that is very different from national news organizations. The LA Sentinel started with the presupposition that we cannot believe anything the police say and that they have to prove what they're saying before we're going to believe them. It appears that Mr. Cochran and I only two black lead lawyers on each side of the council table were somehow dragged into this issue to argue the issue to the court. And I think that may be uh, due in some part to the fact that if anybody should slip and say or utter the word, it's probably better to have a black person. If a white male takes the witness stand and that word is uttered in this courtroom, it will offend every black juror in this case and any other African American within earshot. It is so prejudicial and so extremely inflammatory that to use that word will evoke some type of emotional response from any African American. I would be remiss were I not at this time to take this opportunity to respond to my good friend, Mr. Chris Darden. His remarks uh, this morning are perhaps the most incredible remarks I've heard in the court of law. His remarks are demeaning to African Americans as a group. And so I want to apologize to African Americans across this country. Not every African American feels that way. It's demeaning to our Jews to say that African Americans who've lived under oppression for 200 plus years in this country cannot work within the mainstream, cannot hear these offensive words. African Americans live with offensive words, offensive looks, offensive treatment every day of their life. But yet they still believe in this country. And to say that our Jews, because they hear this offensive word, they hear every day that people call. They interact with people. We've heard this uh, in the questionnaire. To say they can't be fair is absolutely outrageous. Week one of the People versus O.J. Simpson ends with the prosecution on the defensive. But when the first prosecution witnesses testify, the defense goes after one of them only to have that effort backfire in a big way. That's next on week two of OJ25. I'm Roger Cossack. Week two of the People vs. OJ Simpson is, in many ways, the beginning of the trial. The story the prosecution is telling jurors 
Simpson was a wife beater, and Nicole's murder was the conclusion of years of terrible physical abuse. Ron Goldman was simply an innocent bystander, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. O.J. Simpson and Nicole Brown Simpson had had a troubled marriage because there were charges against him for domestic violence and there had been pictures um, of that abuse. The prosecution begins its case by establishing a pattern of domestic abuse with witnesses from law enforcement. Mr. Darden, Ms. Clark, are you ready to call your first witness? Good morning, Ms. Gilbert. Good morning. Well, the call came to you, right? Right, it was the open line. Okay. Could you hear anything over the open line? No, I, at, at the beginning, no. Okay. Did the line remain open? Yes, it did. And while the line was open, uh, at any point in time, could you hear anything? Yes, I did. And what did you hear? At first, I heard a, a female screaming. And did you hear anything else? Yes, I did. And what did you hear? I heard uh, someone being hit. You heard a noise that you associated with someone? Yeah. Hello? Yes, I do. Please be seated for the first and last case. A woman came running out of the bushes to my left, crossed the uh, driveway, she was a uh, female Caucasian, blonde hair. She was wearing uh, a bra only as an uh, upper garment. And she had on a dark, I believe it was a dark, uh, lightweight sweatpants or night uh, pajama bottoms and started yelling, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. Who is going to kill you? She said, OJ. What did you say? I said, OJ who? Uh, do, do you mean the football player, O.J., the football player? She said, yes, O.J. Simpson, the football player. And I saw Mr. Simpson uh, walking towards me from the house uh, wearing a bathrobe. He said, uh, I don't want that woman in my bed anymore. I got two other women. I don't want that woman in my bed anymore. I told him that Nico had obvious physical injuries to her face. She said that he had hit her, and I could see trauma and uh, open wounds to her. She had a uh, cut approximately one inch, I believe, on her left upper lip. She had a swollen right forehead. I believe her left eye or right eye was starting to blacken, it was swollen. And she had some sort of an imprint or some sort of a, a swollen mark that you could see on her cheek. I believe that was also on the right cheek. And she had a hand imprint on her throat, on the left side of her throat. She said that OJ had slapped her, hit her with his fist, and kicked her. She wanted him arrested, and I was going to have to place him under arrest for a spousal battery. She told me why the argument had occurred that night. What did she tell you? She said that uh, there were two other women living in the house, and that uh, OJ Simpson had had sex with one of them prior to going to bed that night with her. Is that in your report? No. Why not? Because uh, right after I finished the report, turned it in, I started getting phone calls from the news media and newspapers, and uh, I didn't feel that it was a relevant part of the, the, the report of the crime, and it would just be a sensationalism thing. She said, you've been out here eight times. Uh, you, you never do anything about it. And uh, she says, I want him arrested. I want my kids back. Uh, I, want, I want to go in the house. What did the defendant say? I said, uh, you've been out here eight times before, and now you're going to arrest me for this? And I remember he emphasized this. I knew that if I took O.J. Simpson, a person with that stature, to the station in his underwear, that uh, there, there would be repercussions because the media would show up and it would 
be a blown out of proportion. OJ denies that he beat Nicole. He says that he just pushed her out of bed. They tell him, listen, we have to arrest you. There's probable cause here, but we're gonna let you go back in the house because he's in his underwear and his bathroom. We'll let you go in and change clothes. Well, OJ goes in the house. Next thing you know, the police hear his Bentley taking off on the other side of Rockingham. There's another driveway. He's gone. That's the uh, sergeant as detective. Detective yeah. Edwards? All right, I'm gonna call you by the wrong name. Detective, are these the pictures at West Los Angeles? Station, right? That's correct. And how many pictures did you take all together? Three. And you had the ability, if the pictures didn't show something you wanted to show, you could take another picture, did you, could you not? Mm -hmm. No. You couldn't take any more pictures? It's out of film. You mean, you, you mean to tell us that the Los Angeles Police Department only had three shots on a Polaroid roll on January 1st, 1989 at the West Los Angeles Station? It's out of film in that camera. Did you get the Polaroid camera, as I recall it, you put another roll in after that finishes. Isn't that correct? Right? right. She wanted to go home. Wait, wait a minute. How long would it take you, sir, to put another roll, uh, slide another container inside that camera? She wanted to go home to her children, and it wasn't my option. I had to comply with it. So you didn't have time to take any more pictures? Is that what you're telling us? That's correct. You did have other film at that station? I would imagine somewhere locked up in that station there was film. There was other film at West Los Angeles Station. Isn't that correct, sir? She wanted to leave. She wanted to go back to her children. Can, can you answer my question? Was there other film at West Los Angeles Station? Somewhere in that station, I'm sure there was other film. And you could have gotten that film, isn't that correct? I, I could have eventually gotten the film. And you yes. could have put that film inside that Polaroid camera, isn't that correct? Yes. You could have taken that camera back to Rockingham, right? I, I could have. And you could have taken the pictures that you claim you now want, isn't that correct? If, if I would have uh, ignored her request, I could have done all those things, it's true. You did not do that, did you? No, I complied with her request with her children. You were a police officer out there, and the reason you take pictures is so you can preserve how the person looked for years later. Isn't that correct, sir? Exactly. Now, please, when the support should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else. So help you, God? I still need to swear. Did he deny causing those injuries? No, he did not. Did, did he admit causing those injuries? Yes, he did. He told me that he was uh, sorry for what he did to Nicole and that he uh, didn't mean to harm her in any way and that he would seek counseling with her. Simpson is charged with spousal abuse. He pleads no contest. He's sentenced to two years probation, 120 hours of community service, mandatory counseling, a $200 fine, and is ordered to make a $500 donation to a woman's shelter. Can you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? Nicole Brown a friend? Yes, I did. As you did the defendant? Yes, I did. And do you and the defendant remain friends today? Well, I still love the guy, but um, I don't know. I mean, this is a weird situation I'm sitting here in. You say you still love him? Sure. Now, that was a really weird moment. OJ looked at me and smiled. And then that, I swear, it was like something just went, like hit me right there. And I went, whoa. But he actually smiled like the old days. I was a police officer at the time, and I was assigned to West Los Angeles Division. Did you ever visit Nicole Brown at Rockingham? Yes, I did. She just kind of got into actually what had happened and started telling me what had happened between her and OJ. What injuries did you see at that time? I couldn't see it that, that well, because I remember she had makeup on. But if I remember, she, there was some swelling about her head somewhere. I remember she had, it was covered up pretty good. It was arguing over some gift that supposedly OJ had given somebody else and she was upset about it. 
OJ, you know, had slapped her and, and chased her around, and, and she, you know, ended up outside uh, with it only only with her bra on. And I think I told her, I said, Nicole, I said, when I was talking to OJ on the phone, he said he, he was trying to hold you off. He said you were their aggressor. And um, it was an isolated incident. And that's when she looked at me and she said, you know, he said isolated. And she had all these pictures. And she goes, well, this is what's happened to me in the past. And I looked at, and I looked at those pictures and I went, whoa, you know? And the first thing, of course, was going through my mind that, you know, I'm like, man, you know, OJ's a batterer, you know? I'm like, and at that point when I saw those, those photos, this can't be the guy that I admire, the guy that never seen mad. I felt so bad, and, and as we were talking, she started crying. You know, I've never seen Nicole cry. Were you ever assigned to uh, teach any particular subject at the police academy? Yes, I was. And what was that subject? Domestic violence. Did you show her the profile of the battered woman? Yes, I did. The victim's profile? Yes, I did. Did you discuss it with her? Yes, I did. And uh, I went over all the, the profiles and, you know, the, the victim, the batterer. And she looked at the, um, what I was showing her. She goes, that's him, that's him, that's him, that's him. And I went, oh, man, you know. And uh, she goes, could you do me a favor and, and, and uh, maybe, you know, go over the profiles with OJ? And I said, sure. I said, hey man, you hit her. She's got marks. You're a batterer. Prosecutors want the jury to hear about a conversation Ship has with OJ the night after the murders. Did you notice anything unusual about the defendant's hand that time? Uh, yes, I noticed that he had um, one of his, on his left hand, I think one of his fingers was uh, bandaged, white bandage on it. Did you pose any question to him at that time? Yes, I asked him how he cut his finger. And what did he say? He said he did it in Chicago. He said he smashed a glass in Chicago and cut his finger. And then I said, oh, okay. And then after that, somebody else had asked him, um, OJ, what happened to your finger? And he said, well, I was, I was chipping golf balls out in the front yard and cut my finger. Then another guy came by and asked, oh, OJ, what happened to your finger? And he said, uh, I was getting the cell phone out of the Bronco. He asked me, how long does it take DNA to come back? He kind of jokingly just said, you know, to be honest, Ship, that's what he called me, Ship. He said, I've, I've had some dreams of killing her. Did he say how many dreams he'd had of killing her? No, he did not. Did he say it was more than one? He just said dreams, plural. I got in the car when I left and I drove home crying. And I called my wife. First thing I did, I called my wife and told her, I, I said, Nina, I said, I, think, um, I said, I think OJ killed her. And she goes, you're kidding me. I said, no, I think he did it. And it was a real sad moment. Know, for me. I mean, because this guy was everything to me. I mean, everything. Isn't it true, sir, that you mentioned to Mr. Simpson that the police had found a glove on his property? The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. remembers O.J. Simpson's dream team as Johnny Cochran, Robert Shapiro, and F. Lee Bailey. But there are other lawyers on the case. Carl Douglas cross-examines Ron Shipp and tries to make him look like a liar and an alcoholic. Carl had a lot of important jobs. Johnny had originally given Carl and I both a number of witnesses to examine at the trial. And one of Carl's witnesses came first, which was Ron Shipp. And that was a particularly awful day for the defense. And 
wouldn't you agree that this statement about this supposed dream is a pretty bad thing about Mr. Simpson? Yes, it is. So did you lie when you didn't tell me about that dream? I sure did. You did? You've lied a few times, haven't you, sir? Never in the court. Isn't it true, sir, that you were hopeful that you would be able to garner some publicity by making up false allegations about Mr. Simpson? No, it's not true at all. Didn't you think, sir, that by concocting this story about Mr. Simpson, it might enhance your own personal profile? Mr. Douglas, I put all my faith in God and my conscience. Since Nicole's been dead, I've felt nothing but guilt, my own personal guilt, that I didn't do as much as I probably should have. But let me ask you this. Didn't you think that by being a witness in this case, it would enhance your own personal profile? <laughs> no, sir. Aren't you an actor? Sir, I have done some acting. Yes, I have. Let's talk about that. Isn't it true, sir, that by being the witness who has a conversation with Mr. Simpson, that it is going to possibly enhance your profile around the world? Oh, well. You may answer the question. <laughs> Mr. Douglas, there is no way, shape, or form that I would sit here and go through all this, put my family through this for an acting career. I could care less if That's I do any question. acting. You do realize, Mr. Ship, that by testifying as you have, you are going to enhance the name of Ron Ship around the world. Just like you're enhancing Carl Douglas by being Mr. Attorney sure. here. You realize that too, right? Yes, I do. So now you're a star as well. Well, I mean, that's, that's what everybody's, you know, that's what they say, people are gonna see you. But that's not why I'm doing this, Mr. Douglas. I'm doing this for my conscience and my peace of mind. I would not have the blood of Nicole on Ron's ship. I can sleep at night, unlike a lot of others. Chris Darden had, had, had been recruiting me pretty pretty much and saying, hey, you know, you, you need to help us out. You need to testify with the stuff that, that you know. And I told him I didn't want anything to do with it. And Chris Darden did something that, that, that I thought was genius on his part because he called me down um, to the district attorney's office. So I sat down and, 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 and he, someone said, hey, Chris, you got a phone call. And he's went, oh, okay, and he gets up and he, and he walks away. And I look and I sit there and I see this, this what, what I knew was a homicide book, you know, and, and Ron and Nicole. And I just opened it up. And I looked at the pictures of Ron, and I looked at the pictures of Nicole, and when I saw the pictures of her, I mean, that, that just ripped me to shreds. I just went, man, this is like really, really crazy. And when Chris came back, you know, and I just looked at him and said, you know, I'll testify. And he goes, huh? I said, I'll testify, man. I'll testify. Isn't it true, sir, that Simpson never said anything to you about there being blood found in the car? No, it's not true. Isn't it true, sir, that Mr. Simpson said nothing to you about blood being found in the house? No, it's not true. Isn't it true, sir, that you mentioned to Mr. Simpson that the police had found a glove on his property? I had no idea what they found in that house, nothing. Didn't you take Mr. Simpson out to behind the, the garage to show him the area where the glove was supposedly found? This is sad, OJ, but no, <laughs> this is really sad. Your Honor, I move to strike that. Ladies and gentlemen, you are dis to disregard Mr. Ship's direct comment to the defendant, Mr. Ship. Please, you're instructed not to do that. Ron Ship just looked over at OJ at one point and just started talking directly to him as if no one else was in the room. It was just this, like, very real moment, and that was on Carl's watch. And it wasn't Carl's fault, but it caused OJ to insist that the second-tier lawyers not get to examine any other witnesses. You drink a lot, don't you? I used to. You've had a drinking problem, haven't you? In the past, I have. Your alcohol problem started when? When I was a police officer. 
about what year did the problem start? I'd say it probably kind of got out of hand, I think, around 83. And you believe that your alcohol problem ended when? Um, probably when I left the police department. Which would have been 89. 89. You were suspended for 30 days while you worked at the academy, were you not? No, I was not. Wasn't there occasion, sir, when you came to the academy with alcohol in your breath? Yes, there was. Didn't you receive a discipline as a result of that conduct? Yes, I did. What was that discipline? I received 15 days suspension. When you say, Mr. Ship, that you didn't have a drug problem, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an alcohol problem after 1989, are you saying by that that you have not been drunk since 1989? I'm saying, to me, a drinking problem. Let me explain this. You know, when I did have a drinking problem, I was the one that told myself, according to all my friends and family, there, everybody was shocked. It was me, it was my standards. I respect that, but my question is, you still have gotten drunk since 89, haven't you? I'd say yes. Were you and he close friends? I'd say we were pretty good friends. We didn't, never went out to dinner like on a regular basis and stuff like that. Did you ever go out to dinner with him and you ever? Well, when he was trying to have me help him get back with Nicole, yeah, he was real. You and he went out to dinner? He took me out a, a couple of times. O.J. Simpson is a football fan, isn't he? Yeah, he loves football, yes, he does. He goes to games a lot, yes, doesn't he? Does. You and O.J. Simpson have never attended a football game together never. in the 26 years that he's been your supposed friend, have you? Not one. You're not really this man's friend, are you, sir? Well, I, okay, to, all right. If you want me to really explain it, I guess you can say I was like everybody else, one of his servants. I did police stuff for him all the time. I ran license plates. That's what it was. I mean, I, like I said, I love the guy. You weren't the kind of friend that he would share some private secret with, were you, sir? Nothing except for the 1989 beating where he needed me. I hated Carl Douglas for a long time. I really did. I mean, I, I you know, the word hate, in my mind was Carl Douglas, <laughs> you know, I really did. Mr. Ship uh, continually was staring at us. I found it myself to be very, very uncomfortable. As week two of the O.J. Simpson trial continues, the defense calls out prosecution witness Ron Shipp for behaving inappropriately in front of the jury, specifically accusing him and some of the family members of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown of exchanging congratulatory gestures after he finished his testimony. I saw Mrs. Goldman gesturing to Ron Shipp and telling him what a wonderful job she did and going like she did and going like this. While the jury was sitting right there. Did she make a thumbs up gesture? Yeah, she, she was also talking very loud and she said, Ron, you did a great job. Like that. When Mr. Ron Ship uh, left the witness stand, finally, uh, he walked through the gates there and he made uh, what has been called a power sign toward the Brown family. This was seen by people in the back row. And uh, the jury was apparently still here. The court uh, needs again perhaps to inquire or check with your staff or check with the photographers in the back row. While you were uh, directing your attention to counsel at sidebar, I was conferring with uh, Mr. Simpson. And Mr. Shipp uh, continually was staring at us, was mouthing some type of word uh, in, a, in some type of attempt to either communicate with me or with Mr. Simpson. Uh, was making very unusual facial expressions uh, that would go from a grimace to a snirk, to a uh, smirk, 